Okay, well, let's dive, let's dive in. Um, first, Adrián Mendoza, thank you so much for joining us on Highest Aspirations. It's great to have you. Hey, Steve. Hello. Thank you. Same thing. Uh, nice being here. I appreciate the invitation. I'm, I'm excited about the, uh, talking uh, just in, in general about everything. So thank you, Steve. Yeah, so we so we knew that we wanted to talk with you for quite a while. Um, and you were you joined us on our Elevation Impact conference. We had some technical difficulties, but I was amazed at the amount of people who came back for the second session that we did a week later. And that speaks to um, I think the relevance and the importance of the topic that we talked about in that session and that we're gonna talk about um in the in the podcast today. And by the way, I have to tell you that my wife, who is a math interventionist, interventionist um, here in New Hampshire, uh, is is a is a big fan of yours. So I told her that I would mention that on the podcast, and that made her that made her uh, happy. So there there it is. <laughs> Boom! There. So yeah, I think just as, as in the classroom, like it's natural th uh, things happen. So yeah, I do remember that that first podcast. I was it was I got froze uh those technology problems uh, they always happen in classrooms and i was like boom we're, we'll make it work uh and yes i did appreciate when i called send an email and they said again people were still there uh and they weren't, weren't have a chance to do it again people that came back uh, i think we also got a good time good conversations there mm -hmm. so it was a great experience staying there thank you yeah and I have to say, for anybody who's listening and doesn't see the video, we'll, we'll put a probably video clip of that earlier. But you have a a golden mic golden that mic. is one of your daughters, and that is glowing neon uh, on your neck, and it's amazing. I want that microphone. <laughs> yeah, some of the recommendations was a microphone there, so I was like, "Boom, do I have one?" So yes, I do have a couple. My daughters, Camila and Sophia, which I'm gonna talk about. My Camilas, my Sophias. I usually talk about them during conferences. I remember that uh, in the in the impact uh, event. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, yeah, I just I'm just using their microphone. I ask them how do they work. They have different like echo sounds. Uh, so I'm 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 hopefully <laughs> I don't push the wrong button, but I think it's we should be okay there. Yeah, well, it'll make it interesting if we hear a little echo. Now people know if you do hear an echo, that's why. Um, it's not my, it's not on my end. It's on, it's on Adrian Mendoza's end. Okay, all right. So let's dive in. So I, I, um, I, I, I used to be a person who said, and I don't think you're supposed to say this anymore, but I used to be a person who said I'm not a math person. Um, but over the course of the last sort of five-ish years at Elevation, I've talked to a lot of people who are math specialists, and particularly they work with multilingual learners in math. And I'm sort of a language person. I taught uh, high school Spanish for a long time. Um, and now I'm seeing the, the kind of blend of both of these worlds come together. And I think a lot of others are as well. So it's really, really exciting for me. And I know for you, this is where I kind of want to start. You talk about this idea um, of embracing mathematical mindsets, which I think is something that I could have used when I was learning math in school. And you outline three of those in your book. Um, so I, I want to start there. How does embracing these mathematical mindsets create an environment that helps students like me, and especially students who are multilingual learners, thrive in class? OK, so that's a good starting point there. Uh, usually uh, during training, uh, we talk about mindsets. Sometimes even with, uh, with math, we always want to get into content, content, content. OK, so talking about mindsets, you start saying, um, I'm not a math person. Well, and, I've, uh, changed. I've changed. I used to say that. Not anymore. I know not and, to say that anymore. <laughs> well, and there's and there's people that say still say say that. Uh, actually, uh, co-wrote this teaching materials. It's a series that uh, Tina Bean started mm -hmm. with teaching science to ELs. And when when I got this phone call, she said, "Adrian, I'm not a math person, or I used not to be <laughs> a math person." So, uh, I think that was a, the th those were the conversations that we needed to have before we were writing the book. Uh, I don't know what's the feeling about the Cowboys uh, football, talking about football uh -huh. there. So I just I'll, I always say like math is like the Cowboys. Either you like them or you hate them. <laughs> I think with the Pats or other football teams, uh, there's this thing about I love mathematics. Or there's some kids that say, I hate mathematics. I'm, I'm not just good at mathematics. So I did make some of the research. I'll give lots. Uh, some of the research that I made was also, I'll refer to uh, Joe, Dr. Joe Baller. Mm -hmm. um, she has her uh, website, her books about ma uh, mindsets in classrooms. Um, so 
I embrace this uh, three three way cycle that starts where it's saying math is open, it's multi dimensional, where we first of all uh, we we provide multiple entry points for kids in the classroom. Mm -hmm. Okay, there's different ways all kids think in different ways. My daughters Camila and Sofia. Uh, this is the first time I'll talk about my Camila and Sofia. Uh, when 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 Camila was born, uh, we had this connection, and I was thinking that everything was gonna be working perfectly with my Sophia, and then I realized uh, I gotta do something different. And I was thinking I'm not a Sophia person, uh, but with different entry points at this point, uh, I'm getting my two daughters uh, to connect with me. So uh, that's what I also bring into my classroom. So math is open, multidimensional. There's different perspectives, especially uh, when we get students coming from different places, mm -hmm. okay, from different countries. Um, we want to be able, uh, we want to be able to respect uh, uh, the respect students' uh, ideas and connections. So there's five ways we thrive. Uh, we start with uh, start where students are. Okay, so just making sure that kids come with ideas. Let's start with with that uh, with that point. Uh, we also with making math multidimensional. We also provide choice. Okay, so uh, there's different choices. These are different methods. Okay, kids get to choose, and when they get to choose, uh, the owner team also comes alive. Um, the second component, and I'll talk. Uh, the second component talks about how do we visualize in math classrooms. Now, when we, uh, I, well, when I learned mathematics, there were no visuals at all. Nothing. Yeah. It was like you solve, 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 solve problems. And nowadays, we look at the standards. We look at all the visuals that are, uh, we're teaching with all these different tools. And sometimes we have that mindset like, oh, I don't think I'm going to need that visual because that's not how I learn in a math classroom. But also thinking about who are my kids and how that visual, uh, it's also going to provide uh, access to language in the classroom. And we'll talk about the importance of language in the classroom. Um, we also talk about encourage dialogue, uh, which is uh, math is conversations and connections. And this is a beauty. When I see, when I go and visit my classrooms, I see Camila's and Sofia's. When I have visited my Camila's and my Sofia's inner classrooms, I just want to hear them talk. I want to see what they say. I want to see how they connect. And then I do like to celebrate successes and talk to with my Camila's and Sofia's. And I think that's a cycle that if we uh, we can prepare every single lesson where kids, uh, kids' ideas are accepted, mm -hmm. where we visualize that and kids can have those conversations, uh, there's where the tribe also comes to life. Gotcha. So my, my follow-up question, you kind of got into this a little bit, specifically, I think, with your Camilas and Sofias. And by the way, I love talking about that. I have four kids and they're all very different and I know exactly what you mean. And by the way, I know your children. How, how old are your, your girls now? Nine and six. Okay, Nine. So so mine are a little older. They're a teenage ones getting ready to go to college. And let me tell you something that it never changes, though. You still always need to find those entry points, which I think is probably the same with students as they grow. I My, my connection here, my question here is, thinking about these mathematical, mathematical mindsets, how do they guide instruction for a teacher maybe who is new to working with multilingual learners? Because we have a lot of math teachers, as you mentioned, who are, and I shouldn't just pick on math teachers, any content teacher who are content first, right? But then, you know, demographics change. You have the, I think, the the advantage and the wonderful pleasure of having these multilingual learner students come into your room, but you don't know what to do. You think, all right, well, how am I going to deliver this content if these students are having a hard time understanding the language? So how do these mindsets guide instruction for teachers for multilingual learners? Okay, thank you for asking that question. By the way, uh, I was in the classroom. Usually sometimes uh, when I talk about the book teaching my two ELs again. Uh, that's a common question. Like, have you been in the classroom before? <laughs> and I, the answer is yes. I taught, uh, I taught fifth grade math and science at some point. I started working in middle school. Uh, at, at some point, uh, as an instructional coach, I, I went from kinder to twelfth grade. Uh, the reason why I'm saying this is that I did lot. I did make a lot of mistakes when we were writing this book. I didn't make any uh, mistakes when I was teaching. <laughs> yeah, yes, and, and I still make mistakes. We still make those mistakes here in the classroom. There, okay. So yeah. it's like, uh, so when when we were writing this book, uh, we have this awesome Silas scene with Anna Matis, um, John Silas, mm -hmm. uh, Tina Bean, Doctor Monica Lara. We were talking about the book, and one of the common questions John was asking me, 
He said, Adrián, go back to your first, second year teaching, okay? By the way, my second year teaching was, was, was my worst year ever teaching. Usually they say the second year is going to get better. It didn't get better. Stop my first slow. year, Yeah, my first year, I got lots of support, okay? So then they say second year is going to get better. Boom, there's where I did make some of the mistakes that I had. So it's like, boom. So what can I do on my third year? Okay, so teaching my two years, it's for these beginner teachers, uh, first, second year, third year. But at some point, all these teachers like us, that we still keep making those mistakes in the classroom. So how does this uh, uh, mathematical cycle support teachers in the classroom, especially when we have newcomers, multilingual learners in the, in the classroom? First of all, if, um, this book provides with different activities like step uh, uh, step one, step two, step number three, and which uh, for the step uh, different activities that provide number one entry point for all students. So thinking about Camila's and Sophia's, I'm doing a lesson. My first lesson is talking. Uh, let's pretend. Let's pretend we're talking about uh, uh, the history in Texas or mm -hmm. in the United States. Okay. I always think if my Camila, okay, can talk about that history, I got one student, but there, I might have other students that have no idea and there's no starting point for them. So with mathematical, uh, uh, making math open, it's always uh, ma making sure that we have that mindset that we're providing entry points to every single student in the classroom and making those connections as we, okay, as we uh, elevate the content expectations, we're also elevating those language expectations. Mm -hmm. um, every single um, part of the strategy is now we as teachers, we also need to have the mindset of putting, uh, thinking about the different visuals that kids might be using in the classroom. Visuals help with making content comprehensible, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. okay? Some of our kids might be one visual away from understanding the content before they go into the different language. I love that way. They, I love that way of putting it, by the way, one visual away from understanding. Yeah, I love that. Yes, and there's where we go back to my Camila's, my Sofia's, which is that visual way. And sometimes we might need two or three or four different visuals until we, we get that aha moment mm -hmm. in the in the classroom. And then the beauty of this is when we come up with visuals, students can also come up with their different visuals. Right. And when they talk about those visuals in the classroom, those conversations, you see their faces, you see those uh, kids making connections. And there's this is our time where we celebrate success, especially when you're a newcomer. Any any moment for a celebration in a math classroom, we're going to take that. And it's not going to be Mr. Mendoza's ideas anymore. It's going to be my students' ideas ideas and every time i see a visual that's come from steve i'm going to go back and say do you see that visual that steve brought into my yeah. classroom and they want to keep they're going to keep trying and that's how we're also going to be lowering the effect of filtering mm -hmm. my classrooms mm -hmm. and there's not going to be this like i'm not a math person or i hate math we're still going to go little by little but we're going to be celebrating those successes i love it i love, I love it. it yeah some ownership as well there too when you have your own visuals that you're using um so looking at the book, you've organized it into four different categories. So you have setting the stage, content delivery, show what you know, and assessment. And we don't have time today to get into all of those. So I, I wanted to focus on some subcategories that seem to be particularly challenging for many educators. Um, and this, these are kind of selected based on the conversations that I've had before, um, not really my own experience in the classroom. But this seem these two seem to be seem to be big ones, and they're interactive direct instruction, which I understand as the ability to deliver direct instruction with some breaks, so that you have some interaction happening while you do that. Because direct instruction isn't necessarily a terrible thing. I think people kind of look at it now as like, oh, don't do that. But there's sometimes it's necessary. And then the other one is academic conversations, which we've talked about a lot, and we've talked to you know, Jeff Sweer is about it, who is very well known in the space. We've talked to John Seidlitz, who you mentioned about it. We've talked to a lot, a lot of people about it. Um, but I want to get into those, um, those two things. As a teacher myself, I would often find myself delivering direct instruction for longer than I wanted or longer than I thought I was, unless I had a time run, which I did at some points. And I was horrified by the amount of time that I was just lecturing students. Um, it's something that I had to work really, really hard to avoid. I think I got better at it over time, but certainly in my first couple of years of teaching, I was terrible at that. So my question is related, what are some ways that math teachers on that first one, 
can um, can ensure that they're building in time for high quality interactions while delivering direct instruction. Okay, so you started actually with the question. There's no time to cover all the different uh, all the different chapters of the book, and and that's that's a good point. But that's a, that's also what happens in the classroom when yeah. you're talking to teachers. Again, there's no time to cover all these different pieces in the classroom, all these different conversations. So direct pitch. Um, talking about the different chapters. By the way, this is something. Once again, this is a third book. Okay. Uh, a, a series of the first book is teaching science to ELs. Mm -hmm. No, I'm sorry, teaching social studies to ELs. Then we did, uh, then Silas, uh, Tina Bean with Dr. Filner did teaching science to ELs. And now we're going into teaching math to ELs. The chapters, okay, uh, the, all of them are the same. We cover the same chapters. We're just changing the activities in, in each of the chapters. When we were talking about direct teach, okay? So in the math classroom, once again, there's too many standards we get to cover, okay? And we, we want to teach content, 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 and content. One of the mm -hmm. mindsets it's, uh, that we need to, uh, to understand is when we teach math, okay? And a question that Valentina Gonzalez asked me at some point is, can we teach math without teaching language? And the answer was like, oh, that's that's impossible. That's impossible. Okay. And sometimes we focus a lot on math, math, math. And as teachers, sometimes, yes, we are experts because we know the content and we want to deliver as much as possible. Mm -hmm. Okay. But so, uh, always keeping in mind that as we're teaching math, okay, the language is also coming there. And I will say language is going to come first. Okay. So can we teach language without teaching math? And the answer is going to be Yes. So uh, in this teaching math tools book, there's uh, there's different uh, strategies uh, for the uh, let's start with direct teach. One of the activities, uh, one of the activities called it's called turn and tell five. Now, usually when talking with teachers, they say I don't have time for my lessons, and there's different ways to structure conversations in the classroom where we let them talk, we let them write, okay. But sometimes uh, conversations don't need to be super long. Sometimes mm -hmm. I'm talking for 10 minutes, then turn until five, share with the, your neighbor, and you have five seconds just to recall the previous slide. We used to read a little statement, okay? And when those kids talk during those five seconds, as a teacher, I slow down, I check for understanding. That's also some process time, okay? So there's no rule about how much time we have in each classroom, because I know different teachers, like I just have 45 minutes, I have an hour, 30 minutes to deliver. Yep. Uh, but just always keeping in mind, as you mentioned, like uh, sometimes as a, as a teacher, I'm talking too much. We, are, we need to end up being facilitators of learning. And at the end of the day, yes, I'm a I'm I can be an expert in the content, okay. But with teaching materials and with the three way cycle, students are going to become being the experts. So here's an idea: you are the experts. You talk, and the content is going to be also discussed from uh, within the students in the classroom. Right. You know, one thing that you said that really resonates with me, and I I went to a. Um... And again, I taught high school Spanish or different situation, but I went to a workshop one time that talked about this, like how do you break up the direct instruction and get students speaking and using the language? And the 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 facilitator ended up doing something that I started doing when I was facilitating professional development, which was this. Close your eyes. We don't have to do it right now, but close your eyes and I'm going to set a timer for 30 seconds. Don't do anything. Just just sit there. And people are shocked and amazed how long 30 seconds is, how much you can say in 30 seconds, no matter if you're fluent in the language or you're new. There's You can do so much in that time. And so I have what it does is it takes down, I guess you could call it the effective filter of teachers thinking, well, I don't have time to do these things. Well, do you have 15 seconds, 30 seconds? Just stop for a sec. And you mentioned like gives you time to gather yourself, to figure out what's next, to observe what's happening with students. So I'm really glad you brought that up, that because I think a lot of people think, well, it's 10 minutes or five minutes or even three minutes, but it doesn't have to be, right? Yeah. Uh, yes. And yes, for these kids, like those 30 seconds, just getting started with something, some some process time. Uh, in the book, I do mention there's, uh, in math classrooms, there's lots of like what I, what I call ghost students. Mm -hmm. Usually a ghost student will be the student that will go into the classroom 
And if you don't expect those students to talk, they're going to sit there, they're going to go to a different classroom, they're going to go to a different classroom, they're going to go home, like nothing happened. And my goal, my mission is when I go and coach is like, who are those go students? How can we get them started? With those yeah. even 30 seconds, just think about it, cheer, process. Um, so yeah, those 30 seconds might be, they, they can be those golden rules. Those kids might be those 30 seconds away from producing language yeah. and from going from I'm not a mad person to yeah I'm a mad person and I can process math in classrooms. Yeah, this is a great way of putting it. Um okay, so from from direct instruction with some interactions to academic conversations. So well, let me start here. I think in in many cases we are probably not you and I at this point, but I think there was a time when I was first starting my teacher teaching career that I would look at multilingual learners' social language abilities. I would hear them speaking in the hallways. I would speak with them on my, you know, just a personal conversation. And I would think, oh, these kids are well equipped to participate fully in their classes. So how come this teacher's worried about the production of this particular student in math or in science class? But what I learned quickly and what we all know now is that this is not the case. So I guess my first question here is more of a general question. Well, I guess I'll back up. Like, are you, my question is, how do we help show teachers the difference between social and academic language? But let's take it a step further out. Do you think that this is still something that that teachers get confused by and struggle with? Or is that changing now? Because I've been out of the classroom for a while. Mm -hmm. Yes, and that's the thing. And I'll share my experience. Okay, so I'm from Mexico. And actually, I live in Mexico. So in 2009, I was invited to go uh, to Texas to teach, okay, uh, multilingual learners, okay? So uh, first time in the classroom, uh, I'm, su I'm supposed to help them with, uh, with language in the classroom. So first time in my classroom, I noticed that all my students, okay, were speaking more fluent than I was. Like yeah. I was like, I, I, did come, I have an accent and I'm very proud of my accent. Okay, but then I go there and have my accent and I see my kids talking like they're kind of fluent and I was like, and I went with my principal and I said like, how am I going to, they, their English is better than mine. Yeah. Okay. Talking about accent and I was like, and there's what I said and say, and uh, my principal said, well, let's look at where your kids are at. Okay. Yes, they can speak. If you hear them at recess, yes, they can produce language. But then I started looking at their folders, paperwork, uh, to help us and say, well, you, we have students at different levels in, tops, in terms of language, language acquisition and academic language. Mm -hmm. So there's where, yes, knowing our kids, they might be able to talk in recess, PE, sometimes your conversations with them, you might be feeling, yes, this case, they know English, they will understand everything. But when I went into uh, teaching and then also like grading, asking them to speak, there was some academic language that was missing. And there's where I understood why am I in these classrooms, okay? Now with this, uh, with the Teaching Materials book, okay? We are aware of this, okay? Thinking about how every single lesson there's academic language vocabulary. Most of these language words, the, speaking about Spanish, these may be uh, what we call cognates, okay? So mm -hmm. cognates are words, same blood from one language to the other one, okay? So understanding that there's some cognates that even with kids knowing those cognates, Every single student in my classroom might not be able to understand what those words are, and there's where we need to go back and create teach. Now, I did make an example about Camila's and Sophia's. Worst thing what we can do in the math classrooms is to start making assumptions. Sometimes we make assumptions like, all my kids know what's a circo. And people look at me, what's a circo? And then I make a joke and I make a gesture of a circo Okay, and there's where kids are understanding and understanding making that connection with that visual mm -hmm. and say, oh, I know what he's talking about. Un círculo maestro. Ya vi lo que es el círculo. Mm -hmm. So there's what we're going to be uh, building and just uh, bringing from that social language to that academic language in the classroom. And uh, of course, every single activity has those sentence starters where I highly recommend that in every single sentence starter, we put academic language or we offer a word back with academic language. And when kids talk, we check for understanding and we also celebrate successes mm -hmm. in math classrooms. 
two two things that you've you've said i think something similar in two different ways and i want to i want to dive into this because i think it's interesting you use the word just now preteach and you use yes. preteach with uh the idea of preteaching language and earlier yes. you said i think and correct me if i'm wrong i'm going to try to quote you okay. you said you can teach language without math but you can't teach math without language is that right yes yes, yes. okay so so Pre-teaching is one of these words that that some people have a hard time with. Like they don't they don't like that word pre-teaching. So explain if you would what you mean. Like maybe even give us an example of what that looks like. If you need to teach language before teaching math, and if you need to pre-teach, what what does that look like to you? Because I think some people get the idea of these these vocabulary quizzes every week where you memorize vocabulary and you write it down and then you forget about it five minutes later. That's not what this is. So I want to make sure people have an understanding of what you mean by that. Good. Okay. So yeah, pre-teaching. So first of all, we're expecting kids to practice language uh, or use words that they're not familiar with. So yes, a pre-teaching can start with a simple pronunciation. Okay. So can all of you pronounce exponential growth? And then we say, oh, exponential growth. And kids can see, can hear it. Okay, if we expect them to use that language, they can hear it and then that repetition is gonna help them in a safe environment. Then if I say exponential growth and I do a gesture of a hand, like growing exponentially, okay, oh, I can see and I show them a graph, like this is exponential growth with that, with that visual. Okay, once again, I'm bringing my Camilas, my Sophias and every student in the classroom. Let's pretend we're playing a game. And in that game, half of my kids don't know how to play the game. What my role is when I pre-teach is to make sure that all these kids mm -hmm. know how to play the game. When I do this gesture, I might be bringing four or five more students into the game. Yeah. Then I do the pronunciation, I'm bringing two more. What if I show a visual where my kids make a connection about a baseball uh, a baseball visual where kids now talk about exponential um, growth? I might be bringing three or four more students into the game. So with pre-teaching, these are like two or three little things that are going to help all kids to be part of the conversations, part of the, the lesson, and they're going to become those language experts. Yeah, it's a, that's a that's a great way of explaining it. I appreciate you uh, elaborating on that, and I love the game um, analogy because we all know from like I'm a person who. You, you can read the instructions to me, but I have no idea how to play the game until I actually sit down and play it or watch somebody else play it. But there are plenty of people, um, you know, I think about one of my kids and then my wife are people who need to sit and read the directions and be like pre-taught how to play the game. And so you, when they do that, you have them on board. And then when we sit down and actually do it, now I'm on board. Now I understand it. But you can't do everything the same way. And that's the same thing with pre-teaching. I think people have the concept that it's one way to do it. You go over the vocabulary and then you move on. But there's so many ways to do it. And in order to get everybody on board, you have to try all of them, right? Whatever's in your tool belt. Mm -hmm. Yes. And, as, and, and the, just as you mentioned with your kids, okay, um, we our, our goal is to get all kids to be part of the game. You want to get them excited uh, into those math classrooms. Typically, and uh, typically in math classrooms, there's always one or two students that know how to play the game. Okay, and we as teachers, okay, there's three things that we can control. Usually there's, uh, we talk about there's no time for the lesson, so there's no, uh, or I have kids that they will never be able to do this, okay, or I have, uh, so the three things from, this is come from the shelter instruction in Texas book, mm -hmm. uh, three things that we can control is motivation, access to language, and quality of instruction. So every time I do the, my lesson, how can I motivate? Or what is that picture that's going to motivate my students? How can I provide uh, that quality of instruction? But also, what? how am I going to provide access to language for my kids so that all of them can be part of their lesson? And yes, a typical math classroom, there's two or three kids constantly being the ones raising mm -hmm. their hands. And the other ones, like, oh, I'm just going to be waiting for the ones who know how to play the game. Right. But our goal is to make sure that all our kids can play that game in those math classrooms. Yeah. And I would even like, I don't mean to belabor this point, but like, you know, when I hear play the game at school, I think about 
students who who just know how to do school, right? But they know how to do school in kind of the traditional way that may be effective for them, but it's not effective for many other students. So we also need to kind of think about the game and how you change the game so that everybody's involved. And I guess that's another conversation for another time. <laughs> I don't mean to get all yeah. philosophical. Um, but that actually does lead me into my, into my next question, which is it's a bit of a natural transition. I want to talk briefly about um, differentiation because I am sure that there are people listening, as there always are, who, and I don't, I hate being an idealist. I hate being a person who proposes these solutions, but doesn't sort of answer the, the, the devil's advocate question or address the elephant in the room. And I think in this case, the elephant in the room, people are listening and thinking, well, I have a class full of multilingual learners at varying stages in their language journey. I have a newcomer. I have some students who are nearly fluent but maybe are lacking some of the academic language. And I have everything in between. And by the way, I also have 10 students who aren't multilingual learners who have their own sort of set of uh, challenges that they need to overcome and advantages that they have. So and this is a big assumption, but let's assume that the teachers have the data to identify students' abilities. Shameless plug. They have elevation. They look at the plan. They know exactly what's going on, where their students are, what level they are. That's a big assumption because many students don't have, uh, teachers don't have that, but let's say they do. They have the data. What are the first steps they should take when thinking about differentiating instruction? This is a good time to think about this is kind of we're getting to the end of the school year. We're thinking about next year. What steps can we take to think about first steps in differentiating for all of these students? Okay, so once again, I'm going to go back to the mathematical mindset, okay? So those multiple entry points. When we talk about differentiation, yeah, there's multiple students. There's Camila's, there's Sofia's at different levels. Now, when I talk about Camila's and Sofia's, I'm not saying Camila or Sofia, I'm not saying who is better than each other, mm -hmm. okay? Sometimes your, uh, your low students, okay, they might be low in terms of language, or they might be beginners in terms of language development, but they might have different aspects from, uh, from different classes. Okay, so yeah. some of the first steps, um, I think first step will be knowing who are our kids. Okay, you, you did mention that if there's a classroom, what we know have different levels, uh, understanding who is my, in my classroom, uh, looking at data is gonna be important as we look at data, what can kids produce, okay? And how are, we're gonna start with their uh, how, how we're gonna start where kids are at in their in the classrooms. Okay, mm -hmm. in every single activity uh, on the teaching materials book, yes, we do have like what can we do when we have beginners, intermediates, uh, fluent, advanced, high. One of the things when we have like newcomers, okay, sometimes uh, time. Okay, some of the, some of those students might take some time to produce language. Those kids. This is what when we were, uh, when we were born, like we were not gonna talk like the first, second day. We're teaching gestures, we're teaching language, we're practicing. It might take them a couple of a couple of weeks to produce one sentence. Then we're gonna go from those simple sentences. We're gonna be celebrating with those sentences with different scaffolds. Now, uh, sometimes in classrooms, uh, we do offer different choices. And one of the things in common question from teachers is, Adrian, do I give them three choices? And I tell kids, you're a beginner, you're not a beginner, and you're going to do this, this, or that. We as teachers have more choices. Um, let's, let's pretend we're talking about sentence time, sentence starters. There's three sentence starters. Some, of, some sentence starters might be for beginners, intermediate, and advanced high. Okay, so as we offer those two or three sentence starters, some of our kids, even your beginners, at some point, they're going to try to attempt the different levels without even knowing. Mm -hmm. Okay, but some others, not participation, not participation. We get into a complete sentence, and that's going to be a that's going to be a celebration. Um, I think the accountability part as well. I think um, knowing kids, kids being aware that as we're raise, raise, raising the content. We're also raising the language and kids come as language experts. Just as me, like I come uh, with an accent. My second year teaching, I have a parent saying, Mr. Mendoza, my daughter is in your classroom, but I'm going to move her from your classroom because you have an accent. Oh. And, I, and I don't think she's going to be learning from you. 
And I was like, boom, oh, talking man. to my principal, my as a principal, Nikki Koniki, she said, Adrian, you are not the problem. Okay. Yes, you have an accent. Okay. But having an accent means probably you speak multiple languages. Okay. And yes, you are an expert in language. And kids, all these kids come, even your newcomers, they're language experts. Okay. So it's also, also about the mindset that we have with those kids. Uh, and as we provide those accommodations, and well, we're also going to be building in that confidence. And then we provide comprehensible input, with the, which once again, bringing those visuals, those gestures, okay, those accommodations, plus the low stress opportunities for output. Mm -hmm. Okay, making it open for the kids. Now, there's a misconception also in math. Uh, well, not a misconception, but there's this, this tendency that thinking that math is all about the answers, like the answers. If I don't know yeah. the answer, I'm not a math person. That's what it was for me. Yep. yep. That's and yeah, that's how like answers, answers, answers. Nowadays, okay, with growth mind with mindset, the the process is more important than the answer. Some kids might know the answers, but they don't even know how they're getting to into those answers. Right. So you're also going with the process. Those are also opportunities for celebrations with our newcomers. And, and we and we go from there. And we're growing every single student. Uh, there's also this thing about bubble students, like these are my bubble kids. I think we're all bubble kids. We all want to go from, if let's just talking about numbers. If I'm in the forties, I want to go to the fifties. If I'm in the seventies, I want to go to the eighties. I think that growth is going to be a component as we go from differentiating in the classroom. Yeah. Great. Great. I don't have much of a follow up there. That was a really good explanation. I would recommend that I do this once in a while. If, if, if you are you want to kind of recap what we just said. I would go back three to five minutes and listen to that because there's a lot of good stuff there on differentiation. And I think you're coming back to this mindset idea, which I think is really, really important, particularly with language. And it's so nice to see these things changing. I mean, I think we take a moment, you talk about celebrations. I mean, I think we can take a moment and really think about and celebrate the fact that mindsets are shifting. Um, it's slow in different places, it's faster than others. Uh, but that that that's a great thing. And I see it with my own with my own kids who are not multilingual learners, but I see the the way that math is is being approached. Again, I see it with my wife who's in math, and it's just a totally different world than the one that I was learning in or or was trying to learn in. It was a struggle for me. So that's nice to see. So moment, moment for celebration and appreciation yes. there. So I wanna I wanna end the kind of content part of our conversation now that I'm with um with as I mentioned, you you we were lucky enough to have you as a facilitator at our annual impact event in at the end of 2022. You did a great session despite the technical um, difficulties. And one thing that you emphasized that really stuck out to me, and I know a few of my colleagues, and you I think you said it a few times, um, and you made the participants who are on Zoom remotely say it as well. And that was if students don't verbalize, students don't internalize. Tell us more about that. What you mean by that? Boom. Okay, so once again, this is uh, a, a John Salis thing. Okay, I started training uh, uh, with Salis Education, and uh, that's something that we're we're building in, into classrooms. Okay, how do we bring those conversations alive and those connections? So we do uh, during trainings, we do these gestures where we show two fingers in front, and then we say, "Students don't verbalize," and then I ask uh, teachers to use those two fingers again. And then say students will not internalize. And I ask them to touch their hearts. Okay. And then I ask them to feel it. Like start, like feel like get into that feeling. Uh, okay, yes, I can be doing all the talking, but just allowing kids to start verbalizing to internalize in the classroom. Okay. Also be thinking about students' hearts. Okay, when they start verbalizing, okay, when you see kids talking with those faces, uh, uh, celebration. Uh, and also as a teacher, when I see my kids verbalizing, I can see who, where kids are, okay, in terms of like differentiation, I can check for understanding, and I'm going to keep celebrating uh, from there. Uh, if I get to visit once again, my daughters uh, into a classroom, yes, I would love to see the teacher talking. Mm -hmm. Okay, but when I go and visit my daughters, when I see my girls, which every time I go into a classroom, I do see my girls, my Camilas, my Sofias are there. I love to see the teachers talking. We like to talk as teachers, mm -hmm. but the the main thing is 
How many times are we going to provide time for my Camilas, my Sofias to verbalize, to celebrate those successes in the classroom? And I think that's, that's, that's one of the goals as I go and visit classrooms. That's one of the parts as we keep transforming education. Typically, every other content like science, the science is changing. I talk talking to science teachers, they say science is constantly changing, history is changing, sometimes math is not changing. We go back to the uh, same uh, all mistakes that we've been making. So I think just providing those opportunities with, where kids come with different ideas. Uh, that's that's the biggest thing there. So I do feel it. I just like, yes, students need to verbalize and we're going to celebrate from there. Yeah, that's great. And that's, I think that's a great way to kind of, we come right back to the beginning of the conversation um, when we, when we go to that expression. So I'm glad we sort of ended the content piece there. I just have two more questions for you other day and they're more um, sort of logistical because I want, you have done a lot of great work and I want to make sure that folks are able to, um, to access it again. You did a session for us um, at Impact, which is a, a, oh, we're getting a little, what was that? Was that a little, uh, was that a third person in the interview? No, it's a full, but we're good. We're good. Okay, cool. Yes, <laughs> it's, yeah, my phone. Yeah, we're good. Okay. So, so I'll just go back. So we, um, so you, it was great to have you on Impact uh, and just, just like a shout out to that. That's a free conference that Elevation does every year. It's virtual. We'll do it again at the end of this year. Information will be out soon on that, but you were on that last year. That session is available in our EL community. I'll link to it. It's really good. It's everything that we talked about today and more. Plus, you get to see Adrian present um, and his slides, which is really good as well. Um, so there's one thing. But how? what are some other ways that people can learn about the work you're doing? Where can they go? Okay, so on so social media, uh, most of my, uh, my social media, well, on all my social media, I have Adrian Mendoza. Has, no, it's not hashtag. It's uh, at yeah, at, at Adrian, Adrian Mendoza ED. That's going to be Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. Uh, I'm also building my Adrian Mendoza ED.com. We also have our silenceeducation.com where you're also going to see like webinars, resources. You're also going to find a different PD on our uh, silenceeducation.com, uh, different professional developments that we provide to teachers. They can be like face to face, virtual. And I constantly do the coaching where we go there and we also learn from mistakes. Uh, we never with students in the classroom and we also build a, like how can we be growing and implementing some of these strategies and also transforming uh, education in the classroom so Adrian Mendoza ED and silenceeducation.com will be the main uh, places where you can find me great and we'll link to those for people who are driving or walking and don't can't jot that down um and I should say I'm glad you mentioned John Silence he introduced us um he's been a thought partner with me in an elevation for since I've started. Um, and so we're thankful for the work that he does and all the great people that he sends, uh, sends our way. We're always happy to collaborate. So last question, other on this one, I ask everyone, um, I'm wondering if there is a book or a film or any other resource at all, and it can be about anything um, that has, has had an important influence on you, either personally or professionally, that you'd recommend to listeners. Boom. So I'll, I'll do, I'll recommend a couple of things. I'm reading for uh, professional development, this new book from Nancy Motley, Small, Small Moves, Big Gains. Okay. But the thing is that my wife is, is reading the book, Atomic Habits. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. So uh, every time that she reads a chapter, I read a chapter, we have a conversation. There's many relationships. So if you're thinking about like in, in educational uh, uh, aspect, the small moves, big gains, uh, it's Nancy Motley talking in the, in the classroom, but it does apply to those atomic habits just yeah. in general. Uh, so that's what my wife, my wife is reading. And we're having beautiful conversations about what we are reading and how we're connected to each I other now. That. My wife is also a teacher, so she said, oh, now I want, I want to read your book, and she wants to read my book. Uh, there's another clip that's uh, at some point my dad shared with me. It's from the, this guy called, uh, named Rick LeBoy, and he makes an analogy about poker chips. There's a video about poker chips in the classroom. So Rick LeBoy, he talks about some kids coming to our classroom okay with plenty of poker chips let's pretend we're in las vegas i have plenty of poker chips what do i do i just gonna play my poker chips and i'm gonna have fun in the classroom but there's other kids that come with zero or one very low poker chips mm -hmm. they don't want to play the game they, they can't take risks those, 
Yeah, they can take risks. So we as teachers, when I watched that video that my dad shared with me, I was like, we as teachers, we have plenty of poker chips in our <laughs> pockets. And our role is to go back and say, notice, okay, these kids have zero poker chips. How am I going to celebrate what have a little celebration? I'm going to put those poker chips in those in those students' classrooms and then making sure that every kid has poker chips to play mat games and just to play live. And that's going to be them. I think that that's a video that kind of changed uh, my way of, uh, uh, when I go visit classrooms. Great. So small moves, big gains. I always ask for one. Everybody gives three or four. It always happens. So small moves, big gains, <laughs> atomic habits, and then this video that I'm going to actually have, ask you to send me so I can link to it in the blog and the show notes. And again, anybody listening, all that information is at elevationeducation.com slash EL community. We'll put a link to that in the show notes of this episode. And with that, Adrian, this has been a long time coming. I am so glad we did it. Um, I'm so glad we could find time to connect your enthusiasm, passion, and knowledge um, in this area is um, is is obvious and contagious, which is, I think, exactly what we need right now. Um, and so appreciate all the work you're doing and appreciate you taking some time to talk with us. Thank you, Steve. Um, uh, this is, uh, I'll, to be honest, this is my first uh, podcast episode. So I think I, I was just very excited. I do visit uh, lots of campuses, school districts, where they use elevation. And for me, like, oh, I'm going to do this with elevation. This is a big thing for me. So I do appreciate that. I'm very excited. This is like a revolution also for me, like a math revolution. <laughs> we teach, we're teaching language. So I think with elevation, with this partnership and uh, with what we're doing together, I think we can change a one, one, one mindset and we can go from there. So one step at a time. Uh, thank you for giving me your time and your space here. Thank you, Steve.